So we want to start by introducing ourselves um, and saying a little bit about key populations. So my name is Robin Dayton, and I'm the gender advisor for the Linkages Project, which is the largest global project dedicated to key populations, a USAID PEPFAR-funded project. Sure, and good morning, everyone. I'm Meg DiCarlo. I'm a senior technical advisor also with the Linkages Project with uh, FHI 360. And good morning. I'm Tim Sladden. I work with UNFPA, the United Nations Population Fund. I'm a senior technical advisor working with HIV and, and key populations. Thank you. Great. And, and I'm imagining most of you know this, but we just want to make sure key populations gets used in a number of ways. So when we say key populations, we're talking about the four key populations most affected by HIV, which are gay men and other men who have sex with men, sex workers of any gender, people who inject drugs, and then transgender people. So that's really going to be the emphasis of our presentation. And we would love to know just by a show of hands, how many of you all have in the past or are currently working on key population programs? OK, excellent. So it seems like people have a lot to share during the discussion part. That'll be, that'll be great. So our goal of this session is to convince you, or for those of you who are already convinced, to give you a little bit more to use when you're articulating why in an environment of reduced HIV funding, we really need as a collective community to make programs for key populations a sustained priority and ensure that those programs go beyond service delivery. So that's really our hope for this presentation and then the Q&A that follows. And the ways that we're going to do that, each of us will give a presentation. Tim will be talking really about leveraging the sustainable development goals for key populations, and then Meg about the fundamentals of key population programming. And I'll be presenting on the essential nature of human rights protection and promotion for an effective HIV response, particularly for key populations. What we're thinking is that we'll have you all hold your questions until all three of us have presented to really do kind of a, a total Q&A. And we would really love, because this is all about you know, advocacy and articulating this important need, as they come to you, if you have pithy little points that you would like to put down and then tweet, we're going to provide the Linkages uh, Twitter handle that you could tweet at, and we'd be happy to retweet any really particularly compelling messages that you have. So with that, um, sorry, Tim, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. That's yeah. working now, yeah. Good morning, everybody, yes. So my um, initial presentation is really to set the scene uh, about the sustainable development goals and how we can really leverage this new development framework to support programming with key populations. Um, so I want to just introduce the SDGs. We also have a new UNAID strategy that started this year. And we also have this year the UN General Assembly Special Session on Drugs, uh, which is another key high-level meeting. Uh, then I'll look at the, the HIV responses within the SDGs and particularly about uh, key population responses. And finally, just mention some of our resources that we have for doing this. So the SDGs, starting this year, it's a 15-year new development cycle and it's very ambitious. There are 17 new goals. Uh, some of them are carried over from the Millennium Development Goals, such as uh, ending poverty and hunger, uh, ensuring quality education. But there are new goals around the environment, uh, climate change, uh, a strong theme of inequalities, addressing inequalities, and, and some other specific goals that have been um, now developed. Uh, very comprehensive and an ambitious agenda. Uh, they build on the MDGs, which we've just wrapped up and, and reported on with, with varying success. There is no MDG 6 anymore, which was uh, ending AIDS, uh, TB and malaria. So there is a general health goal, uh, SDG 3, but um, HIV is a little bit more buried now, but, but it is there across the whole agenda. Um, it's a very holistic process with interrelated goals. Uh, human rights remains at the centre of all of the goals, and this is what really drives the whole development framework. 
leaving no one behind, ensuring universal coverage and access, um, looking at the inequalities. And this is particularly important now that the SDGs are not just looking at the least developed countries. Uh, they are applicable to all the member states of the UN, so including high-income countries. So working on inequalities is, is fundamental within the whole framework. And this is, all of these principles are really uh, central to working with key populations. Uh, the UNAID strategy for the next five years, it also has ambitious targets around treatment, ensuring high percentages of people diagnosed, accessing treatment, uh, big reductions in the numbers of new cases of HIV, and ending discrimination, which is one of the key barriers to our HIV response globally. And the, the General Assembly special session on drugs this year. Uh, this, there are a lot of question marks. It'll be very interesting to see how this progresses. Will we be able to get uh, global drug uh, reform and, and coherent drug policy? Uh, there's a lot of traditional and, and conservative uh, expression of, of feeling and value, so it's, it's difficult to progress this very sensitive agenda. Um, but we're looking for further harm reduction processes, introduction of needle and syringe programs, uh, opiate substitution therapies. These are the, the, the core principles of harm reduction that we would hope to be introduced. Uh, it's significant in its impact on people who inject drugs, but we will wait to see what the outcomes of this uh, special session will be in the, the political declaration. So the SDGs, let's now drill into those and look at uh, where, are the, where is HIV really, um, where can we really leverage the SDGs to, to uh, maintain our response to HIV? And I'm going to look at several examples in turn. Uh, addressing inequalities is central to to the SDGs, and SDG 10 is, is specifically about this. The way these slides are structured are, at the top there are sort of general HIV approaches and um, strategies, and then at the bottom of each slide are the key population specific activities that we would like to promote. Um, so I'm just really going to look at the key population issues for time. And, uh, Inequalities, well, we could look at many aspects of inequalities for key populations, but accessing um, combination prevention is particularly important to ensure that they have access to biomedical interventions, uh, such as condoms, PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis is a new uh, way of, of preventing HIV transmission. Uh, behavior change, a lot of behavior change communication strategies we need to uh, ensure are maintained, use of condoms, uh, reducing demand for uh, un unprotected sex uh, from sex workers, and then the bigger picture structural issues, the, the legal reform, access to education, preventing discrimination. And uh, as well as these combination prevention approaches, core to all of this is uh, community empowerment, uh, building, uh, building environments where, where key population communities can uh, develop their structures and coordination and uh, help their, their constituencies. And I know that uh, Meg will talk more about this. Uh, SDG 3, about health and well-being, and the uh, access to antiretroviral therapy is obviously key for people living with HIV. And all of these uh, treatment programs, we have to see that they're tailored for key populations, that we have competent and non-judgmental services that are offered in the appropriate space and the appropriate way so that there is good uptake from uh, key populations. And part of, essential part of this is engaging uh, key population members who will be part of the delivery of health services and community-led responses. Gender equality is, is uh, central to the SDGs too, SDG 5. And in terms of key populations, we look at gender in a very broad perspective, in, including uh, preventing discrimination, violence against lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, and intersex people. 
So uh, really seeing a holistic view of gender. Um, there's, we need to empower sex workers of all genders and uh, provide programs for, for women who inject drugs and the female partners of males who inject drugs. Uh, and lastly, gender transformative approaches, changing male attitudes to, uh, towards sex workers, towards demand for unprotected sex. Education is another SDG that where you can leverage, and here it's ensuring key populations, especially young key populations, have access to the skills and knowledge that they need to uh, prevent infection. There's also sensitization of service providers to make sure that they are providing non-judgmental services. Uh, a whole range of service providers that come into contact with key populations to prevent discrimination and violence against key populations. Uh, there's two SDGs that look at uh, employment and uh, poverty, decent work and economic growth. And uh, we have to make sure that workplaces are friendly places for key populations, that there is no discrimination, that there are policies in place to ensure that. Um, sex work, we have to see that sex work is seen as work and decent work, and that uh, it, there are occupational health and safety standards put in place to make sure of safety and, uh, and hygiene. Um, sex workers need broader economic empowerment, so they need access to other forms of income to, uh, to diversify their, their sources of income and, and, and empower them economically. And uh, we also need harm reduction programs for people who inject drugs to enable them to spend uh, more focus of their time on, on employment and not on, on seeking their drug use. Cities and sustainable communities, this is a new SDG, which is a very interesting one and very relevant for key populations who often tend to congregate within uh, cities. And we can find that we have perhaps more successful programs at the local level, talking with local city councils, local mayors may be much more receptive to setting up programs that are um, specifically tailored for key populations than if we're working at the national level. We can perhaps bypass some of the national sensitivities and, and laws and, and get implementation of, of programs at the local level by pragmatic local councils. Um, there's a lot of need for uh, local um, community-based programming, so outreach, drop-in centres, uh, working with um, the, the fast resp rapid response legal teams who can uh, attend if there's a, an arrest that's going to happen and then refer people also to fixed site services. Uh, SDG 6, Peace and Justice is 16, is, is very uh, central and really looking at preventing violence against key populations, which is often their greater concern than uh, preventing HIV where there is violence occurring. This is of primary concern often to key populations. There's a whole range of decriminalization, uh, looking at law, law reform to try and reduce the harm related with the criminalization of, of key population behaviors. Um, and really it's about ensuring that key populations have the safe space and environment to claim their human rights. And just the, finally, the, the last one is to, to encourage partnerships to, in, to ena enable all of this to happen. Um, the, we in the UN are very much concerned with brokering dialogue between governments and civil society, and many development partners can take this role as well. Uh, there's a lot of need to sensitize opinion leaders and civic leaders and policy makers, and really to engage key populations in the uh, prevention and programs uh, for HIV. So, in summary, uh, AIDS, although we don't have MDG 6 anymore, ending AIDS remains central to the, uh, the new SDG framework, achieving uh, ending AIDS as a public health threat by 2030, and 
we, we will only achieve this if we empower and include key populations in the responses. Um, there are many SDGs which are entry points for working with key populations, and the central principles, human rights, universal coverage, addressing inequalities are, are really central to the, uh, to the SDGs and to working with key populations. And we know that a combination approach is, is the best way to uh, achieve these goals. Uh, there are many tools, I'm not going to go into them now, but I can provide details later. We know what works, and uh, so there are many resources that we want to roll out and ensure program implementers, implementers uh, take up these resources. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'll hand over to uh, Meg now. Great. Well, Tim has done a good job at laying out sort of the global architecture of key populations programming. And I'm going to jump now into sort of a program perspective of the fundamentals of HIV programming with key populations and sort of the why, what, and how of uh, key populations programming. So again, who are the key populations? They are sex workers, men who have sex with men, people who inject drugs, and transgender persons. And I thought I'd just start off with a quote from the U.S. Uh, Global AIDS Ambassador, Ambassador Burks, um, said that we know that if any one of our populations is left behind, if any one of us is left behind, all of us are left behind, and we won't control the pandemic. And indeed, that is really kind of echoed in the epidemiology when we look at the epidemiology of key populations. This shows um, HIV prevalence among sex workers over about a four-year period in 19 countries. And we can see that across the board, the HIV prevalence is um, significantly higher than that of the general population. Um, and indeed, globally, uh, the HIV prevalence among sex workers is 12 times that of the general population. And we really see this across both concentrated epidemics as well as generalized epidemics. For MSM, the pattern is similar, again, um, and elevated HIV prevalence uh, amongst MSM than the general population. Um, and they are 19 times higher globally than the general population, the HIV prevalence. I didn't include for people who inject drugs or for transgender persons, um, but the HIV prevalence for people who inject drugs is actually 28 times higher than that of the, pop the general population. And if we look at transgender women, it's actually 49 times higher than that of the general population. So the, the case is really clear as to why we're talking about key populations. So what can we really do about it? Well, in order to start focusing on some of the, the services, we can look at this HIV cascade. And the HIV cascade sort of shows us how we get to people to the 90-90-90 goals of UN AIDS, which are 90% of people living with HIV diagnosed, 90% on treatment, and 90% virally suppressed. And we know that viral suppression is important, not only for quality of life, but also for onward transmission of HIV. And in order to get to viral suppression, we really need to start at the beginning, which is identifying key populations. And that really comes from size estimation uh, and mapping. And then we need to look at how many key populations are we reaching with prevention and mobilization for testing. Of those that get tested, for those that are HIV negative, how many are uh, re-engaged in HIV prevention and repeat testing or PrEP? Um, how many that are HIV positive are then enrolled in care, put on treatment, retained on treatment, and then eventually virally suppressed. So these steps in the cascade um, are really the services that need to be provided. They're the testing and the ART, um, and that is really a comprehensive package for key populations. The sort of writing around human rights and supportive laws, as well as community mobilization on the top and the bottom, those are some of the more structural factors, and those are absolutely critical for key population programming. I'll get back to those in a minute. But first, let's just look at the comprehensive package of services for key populations. Um, Tim talked about this a little bit, but really they're, I've kind of divided these up into the behavioral interventions and commodities, clinical services, and structural interventions. And really the most important thing here is just that we have a comprehensive program in place for key populations. Um, any one of these alone really is just not going to work um, and get the job done. 
This looks at some of the evidence on different services for sex workers in particular. Uh, the data is taken from different countries, showing the importance of different parts of the package of services. Um, condoms remain the most important sort of prevention uh, intervention that we have. They've, it's been shown to have reductions in incidence of 70% in sex workers. Um, STI treatment, uh, sex workers are disproportionately affected by STIs, and they play a very important role in both HIV acquisition and transmission. Um, and remain to be a very important uh, intervention for sex workers. The structural interventions are absolutely critical, and for other interventions like HIV testing or STIs or ART to actually work, the structural interventions absolutely have to be addressed. So how do we do this? <clears throat> well, we need to really look at the realities of key populations, and this is the realities of a, of a sex worker. Um, key populations have a lot of unprotected sex, and there are a lot of reasons why they have a lot of unprotected sex. Um, this is a sex worker whose reality is that she has more clients than condoms. She has some clients who refuse to wear condoms, and when she's beaten by clients, perhaps for not for wanting to use a condom, she has nowhere to turn. So these are some of the realities um, that key populations face. Um, they're really not the same realities as the general population. And these realities have to change if we're going to be successful at all in key population programming and in really taking advantage of all of what we've learned about HIV prevention and treatment interventions. So let's put those, some of those sort of things into a program perspective. A lot of us are programmers here. These are what the realities kind of, when we put it into uh, development terms, these are what they come out to be, right? So stigma and discrimination, um, criminalization, which really forces a lot of key populations underground and keeps them hidden and, and hard to reach. Uh, the lack of agency of key populations because they're so marginalized. Uh, Robin will be talking a little bit more about human rights and violence, but we know that many sex workers, for example, have just normalized violence in their lives and that violence is, is normal. Uh, it's kind of an expected part of everyday life, and that has to change if we are going to be successful with key populations. Uh, a lack of trust, obviously, of service providers, of government, of police, of uh, different people who may be harassing or um, violating human rights. And then reluctant providers. Reluctant providers, it's not just, you know, it may be stigma and discrimination, but it's also um, some providers are reluctant because they don't feel they have the clinical competency to uh, treat anal STIs, for example. So these are all of the challenges um, that key population face. And when we talk about how we program with key populations, it's actually not al always the what, but it's the how that is most important. And we really have to have community-driven responses. In order to address all of the issues that I've been talking about, communities need to drive the response. And this is, you know, this sort of shows the increasing levels of participation from you know, programs being decided by others to action um, for key populations, actions in partnership with key populations, and then actions that are really driven by key populations. This shows, this is something we use in, in linkages, um, which is really just outlining the different elements of, of key population programming. Um, and I'll just talk briefly about how we actually use a community-driven response for size estimates and mapping, for program planning, for peer outreach, um, and also for monitoring and data use. For size estimation and mapping, we often think that this needs to be done by technical experts who are high-level researchers from esteemed universities. Um, that's not always, for a, from a program perspective, this can actually be done by key populations. So for example, sex workers can go out and map their uh, hotspots that they are familiar with. They can estimate the size of sex workers in a particular hotspot. They can look at whether condoms are actually available in that hotspot. They can look at whether uh, violence is common in that hotspot. And so from a program perspective, we, this should be driven by key populations. It should be driven by, for example, sex workers who can go out um, and do this mapping and size estimation. And it leads then into them doing some of the peer outreach based on the information that they have at hand. It's not to say that we don't need validated size estimates and mapping. That certainly is, is still required. But from a program perspective, uh, this should be done by key populations. 
I'm going to just skip that. Um, in terms of the next step, which is peer outreach, this is sort of showing a peer plan, a monthly plan that a peer educator in India would use. And normally they have, you know, 20, 30, 40 sex workers. I have two rows there um, where they would have two names. And this kind of allows a sex worker to assess the risk and vulnerability of the other sex workers that she's reaching out to. So she can talk to that person about whether they're using condoms, um, if they have a low income, are they abusing drugs or alcohol, um, are they using condoms with their regular partner, do they have a high client load, um, you know, are they being harassed or exposed to violence. And so this sex worker can then target um, kind of individually the risk and vulnerability of that other sex worker and can really kind of prioritize uh, the other sex workers that she's reaching out to. So again, it really kind of puts the programming from the initial stage of, of mapping and size estimation, that first rung in the cascade, that identification of key populations, it really puts it in the hands of the key population member, or whether it's a sex worker or an MSM. And I'm focusing on sex workers, but um, MSM, this can also be done with virtual sort of meetup sites um, and other gathering places where MSM are. So just kind of to highlight this again, these are the different uh, stages or, or pieces of programming where we can really empower the role of peers who are key populations. It starts with the mapping, um, goes into site selection, um, then that micro planning of where am I gonna work, who am I gonna prioritize, um, and then me actually as a sex worker looking at my own data from my own that I'm collecting to be able to kind of refine what I'm doing. This is a, a graph from uh, the Abahan program in India, and it talks about, it just really shows that when community involvement went up, STI attendance went up, and the rates of STIs went down. It's not necessarily a causal relationship, but it has been, a, community involvement has been associated with increased service uptake um, and better outcomes. So just when we're delivering a key population response on the ground, there's just a few things that we should be talking about. Um, of course, the most important thing is, is the program driven by the community? And that's really what I've talked about today. But we should be looking at, do we have the comprehensive package available? Is coverage up? Are we reaching the right people with the right services? Uh, are outcomes improving? Um, how are we managing the program? And how can we make it work better? So with that, I'll turn it over to Robin to talk about human rights. So some of what I'm going to touch on is, um, is really going to, to drill down into some of the points that both Tim and, and Meg raised. And we want to end on this issue of human rights because they are so pivotal to key population programming that they, they really are an excellent vehicle for that pro for human rights, a human rights approach, as well as obviously a necessary uh, investment in terms of effective programming. And in this presentation, I'm gonna talk about some specific human rights violations and their, their link to HIV and how that link has been made really effectively by researchers and advocates and others to show that the necessity of investing in, in a human rights approach to HIV programming. We're gonna talk about what some communities have been doing to address human rights violations that they face as well as what linkages and others are doing to address those issues. And then we're gonna end on a, a hopeful note about the value of a human rights approach even beyond HIV programs. All right, so I think it's helpful to start with a reminder of what human rights are. I think that term gets thrown around a lot. And you know, I think we all basically have an understanding of it. It's essentially the freedoms and dignities that we all have because we're humans. And so they overlap with a lot of these issue that, issues that Meg is bringing up around violence, around criminalization. I think the three that you're gonna hear most often in the presentation I'm giving are around right to life, to equality and non-discrimination, and to the highest attainable standard of health. So what this presentation is answering is in relation to all of these prevalence rates that Meg brought up, which is why or how do human rights violations affect the HIV prevalence among key populations? And I think you could say this another way, which is how human rights violations caused key, key populations most affected by HIV to be the key populations most affected by HIV. 
And also, at this point, how they're really inhibiting the HIV response. So I'm going to start with sex workers. I am going to go through all four of the key populations, but I just want to spend a little bit of time here to talk about these three areas, which you're going to see across every single key population. So the first is this issue of criminalization. 116 countries have punitive laws against sex work, and those can look a number of different ways. But as Meg alluded to, the, the sort of repercussions are generally the same, that you have sex workers who don't have legal recourse when a client doesn't pay them, when a client forces them to have sex. You have sex workers who are routinely harassed by the police who can justify that harassment because they're doing their jobs. You know, of course, it extends beyond that to, to rape of sex workers, to stealing from sex workers in order to, for example, not detain them, that you kind of, the police will offer them that exchange. And then it also extends to things like when condoms are used as evidence against sex workers, then they don't carry condoms. So clearly that has ramifications for HIV risk and prevention. Stigma and discrimination in the healthcare setting, I like to think about this in three ways. One is that if you know or you've had friends who've had an experience where they were treated poorly, you're not gonna go get services. The second would be that maybe you go get services but you don't disclose all of your risks and then it's very difficult for the person providing your services to give you the services and advice that you need. And then the third is that maybe you, you, know, you go, you disclose your risks and then instead of condoms and lube, what you get is a morality lesson about why you shouldn't be a sex worker any longer. And so clearly all of these have impacts ultimately on the services that sex workers are able to get and on their ability to both protect themselves from HIV or to get services when they're living with HIV. And then finally, you know, and I think kind of overarching of all of this is violence. And violence for sex workers comes from a lot of places. Meg talked about some of these. So we have client violence, we have police violence, we have partner violence, which is often justified where someone will say, oh, you know, but you're a sex worker. Like, that's why I'm being violent towards you. We have violence from third parties like brothel owners, um, bar establishment owners. And then, I mean, I think it's just so important to realize like violence in and of itself, you know, a terrible human rights violation, but the repercussions for an HIV response, there's a lot of evidence that shows that gender-based violence, and violence generally, is a risk factor for HIV. Living with HIV is a risk factor for violence, so there's kind of that duality there. People who've experienced violence are less likely to go and test, they're less likely to disclose when they test positive, and they're less likely to adhere. So I think we really need to think about, as a community, investing specifically in violence if we want to have an effective HIV response. And of course, to not be in entirely negative, there is a lot being done, including by the sex work communities on these issues. And so this is an example here of a poster for the International Day to End Violence Against Sex Workers, which is December 17th, and, uh, and marches that take place each year on this issue. I'm showing you this because I, I would really love, you know, there's some slides in here I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on and it's great that the mini U is providing these to everybody because there's so much rich information out there, including on how we make the case that human rights violations have this immediate and extreme impact on HIV outcomes. This is a great article that Michelle Decker and others wrote on the burden of, of human rights violations and how they relate to HIV. She also goes through in each table and explicitly, um, ex explicitly identifies the human rights violation and the treaty, or the human right and the treaty that's associated with, which you can then use with policymakers and other decision makers. I'm only gonna go into detail on this first, uh, this first row, physical and sexual violence by police, just to say that you know, when you look across the literature, you see this burden is incredibly high. So between seven and 89% across these different studies reporting sexual violence, between five and 100% reporting physical violence, again, by the police. And that this, all of these factors on the far right have been shown through the literature to be the outcomes of that violence. So you see that a lot of the police uh, for sex is unprotected that it's significantly associated with accepting more, accepting more money for unprotected sex, inconsistent condom use, and STI, HIV infection with other clients, or with clients, as well as, of course, undermining the sex worker's ability to go to police when she needs to. We have quotes in here that I, I'd like to direct you actually to um, the resources in the bottom right, which is our Rights in Action series. If you look up Rights in Action and linkages, these will come up for you easily through a Google search where we are able to bring up some of the community responses to violence. And this one I really like just because it talks about, at some level, again, like Meg talked about, when you, when you feel that violence is part of your job or that you deserve violence, when you don't know what your human rights are, that that's a huge barrier as well. 
All right, moving on to gay men and other MSM, we see the exact same issues. We see criminalization, stigma and discrimination in the healthcare setting, but of course more broadly, and then violence. And the, the response here that I wanna point out is this document, Services Under Siege by MSMGF, where they talk about really trying to quantify the types of violence across the globe that MSM are experiencing, actually LGBT people generally are experiencing, and the effects of those, that, those experiences of violence on services. So those really not thinking about violence as something that you kind of do if it's nice in HIV programming, but as vital to an effective HIV response. And I love this quote because I just think it spells it out, right? The extent to which healthcare providers continue to shame, humiliate, or chastise men who have sex with men is the extent to which they will avoid prevention, care, and treatment services. So direct correlation there. I think that's a really, or a really powerful way to put that. For transgender people, this is another example of a way to really make this connection for decision makers on how human rights violations directly lead to higher HIV prevalence as well as lower uptake of services. And I wanna just point out two things here. One is that we see the exact same issues, right? We see criminalization. In this case, it's of gender impersonation as well as homosexuality because so often trans women are conflated with MSM. We see violence all across the life cycle, we see inadequate health care. In this case, this includes not, not having access to competent providers, like Meg was talking about, who don't know how to, to deal with anal warts, but in this case may not know what transgender is. So people having to educate their providers, but who definitely are not offering gender-affirming services like hormone therapy. And then the final piece here that really makes this population different is this lack of gender recognition, where many, many people are not able to get legal identification in their gender, right? So if I'm a trans woman and all of my documents say that I'm a man and they identify me as male and they have my male name, how am I gonna be able to take that document when I'm applying for a job or applying to go to a university or trying to get services? So the barriers that are created just in this first column end up having these lasting impacts all the way across. And a lot of the issues around you know, violence and a lack of ability to access education and other services end up resulting in unemployment which ends up meaning that sex work is the only real opportunity for work that a lot of trans women in particular have. And so that then, that now this population is gonna be subjected to all of the human rights violations as well that sex workers are. So there's a lot of overlap here as well. And I think that this does a lot to explain that 49 times among trans women in particular, why that prevalence is so high. This is one of the community responses to violence, to human rights violations from the trans community. It's the murder monitoring update. And this just shows that um, in the year between October 1st, 2013 and September 30th, 2014, there were 226 reported cases of murdered trans people. But obviously you see the grayed out countries that are not reporting that is, is not really even close to what actually happened. But it is still right a powerful advocacy tool to talk about what's going on. This is a quote um, actually from, from a really young trans activist and I just appreciate that she outlines all of these issues that she's facing and talks about what they really, really need. Like again, the priorities for them are these gender affirming HIV services that respect them and acknowledge them and treat them as partners. And I think that so speaks to what Meg was saying about empowering communities, working with communities, that's gonna be fundamental to any effective human rights approach. So finally, people who inject drugs same three, sorry to be a broken record, with the addition here of some compulsory rehabilitation and other punitive measures that happen that even further disincentivize seeking services. And this, is a, um, this speaks to Tim's points on harm reduction. This is from the AIDS Alliance in India where they're talking about people who inject drugs are people who need support and not just punishment. Or not punishment, support and not punishment. All right, and this is a, another quote. This is from Elliot Albers, who's the, um, the head of the International Network of People Who Use Drugs, again, about just the need for human rights, a human rights approach in these programs, and all of these are in these rights and action briefs. All right, I'm gonna skip over a few of these for time and just go here to the select linkages activities. We, you know, link, linkages takes very, very seriously. I think hopefully that's come through in Meg's presentation and mine. Human rights is one of our cross-cutting areas. We understand that this is vital and that it needs to be advocated for because it does cost money and it does require time, but you can't just offer the, the services side. And so some of what we're doing to make sure that we are protecting, promoting, securing human rights, we do do a lot of community engagement. The Linkages Advisory Board includes global representatives of the four key population networks. They really do a lot of the visioning work 
to help make linkages what it is, providing that community input, and that extends to the ground. So we do direct sub-awards with key population-led organizations. I think the count is about 50 right now uh, across, you know, across our global project. And then for even you know, research, anything we're doing, we have local and regional partners who are members of key populations that provide guidance. We do a lot on violence response. Almost every country we're working in, we have specific activities on violence response. We have a healthcare worker training that we're rolling out, it's finalizing now and will be rolled out shortly, that really emphasizes stigma and discrimination. We're working to document human rights violations so that they can be used in advocacy. And then this rights and action focus, both like in the briefs I'm talking about, as well as our social media, everything we're doing, really trying to provide a platform for members of key populations who may not be able to have their voices heard at that global level, giving them that option. So I just wanted to end, this is, you know, this is my kind of, let's end on this hopeful note, <laughs> which is that I, I hope, you know, if you weren't already convinced coming in, that you've seen that human rights violations are one of the main reasons that key populations are key populations, and that they are hampering the HIV response, and that if we are going to change, if we're going to be effective, we really have to change our way of thinking. I love this quote, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. When we created all of these problems, I don't think we thought about, human, about key populations as humans, deserving human rights. And at the fundamental level, that's what has to change. And so here's, here's kind of my hopeful pitch. Human rights violations against key populations obviously didn't start with the HIV epidemic. They have been going on for, you know, for, for quite a lot longer than that. But hopefully by using the resources that HIV brings to bear on approaches such as community empowerment, and these are the two organizing principles of the documents that Tim mentioned, the sex worker implementation tool and the MSM implementation tool. By making community empowerment really central to those, we not only are able to have a more effective HIV response, but we're also able to give key populations a voice and tools that they use to advocate for the other things that they need, which you know clearly extend beyond HIV. So I'd like to end there and with a quote, um, Kevin Osborne, who until recently was the project director, who I think just expressed this very, very well uh, about these inextricable links, and then open it to questions. Which, are we, are we facilitating the question part? Okay, so any, I can sit back down, any questions? Or com comments, anything people wanna share? Yeah. Hi, I'm Marjorie Macieda, and I'm a consultant. I work a lot with adolescent sexual reproductive health. So my question is, within the key populations, um, with all the challenges already, um, often there are young people that are part of that subset, and what are the extra sort of challenges within that age group? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. I don't, I, do you want to speak to that? It is a good question, and, and young key populations are, are often very neglected, and sometimes service providers are, are shy away from providing services. Uh, I think briefly I could say there is a series of, of briefs we've developed, and I can give you the links to those afterwards, which really capsulate the extra resources and approaches that we need for young key populations. I think part of the, the solution would be to ensure that service providers are not going to be penalized for providing services and that give them discretion that uh, if they're working with young people and they see young key populations that they're able to go that extra mile and, and engage them in, in services that we need for all key populations. I think as well, we so we're completing right now a gender analysis in Kenya across all four key populations. and. One of the things that's really come out is that there is so much power in community. So when a young man who has sex with men identifies as gay, he's gonna have access to a lot more services because he's able to tap into the peer educators, to you know, the MSM serving clinic. If he doesn't identify as gay, if, and especially you know, this is really common among young people before, before he's able to be out in that way, if he ever wants to be, but before he's able to be out in that way, 
just the, the limits that he has on the, the key population designed services might not be reaching him. Like he, he just may not be the target audience. So I think ensuring that there's youth friendly key population services and also that, um, you know, and I know that these briefs that Tim is m mentioning speaks to, speaks to these issues, but um, making sure that, that we are thinking about people who may not have this identity and, and imagining that a lot of them might be young and that we do have outreach that's gonna be able to, to contact them as well. Yeah, I think just along those lines, I would just, it's really what Robin just said, but around the, the current youth programming that exists, I think often doesn't think about uh, key populations and that they're part of a lot of the clients that are coming in and they may not be self-identifying at a young age. And so some of the existing kind of youth programming really needs to start thinking about how they are um, kind of addressing some of the young key populations that are out there. Other questions? Tweets? You want to just... <laughs> Hi, I'm Gretchen, I'm an MPH student here at GW. Um, and you talked a lot about the peer-to-peer -peer education and community empowerment, which is great, but so many of these behaviors are not just stigmatized, but illegal in many countries. So how can you kind of, how are these programs kind of like working with the system or like what are, what's happening to decriminalize some of these behaviors, um, especially with like police abuse. And I mean, that's like such a systematic thing when they're like doing their job and they can kind of get away with these like horrible atrocities under, under that guise. Well, certainly supporting local networks of sex workers or men who have sex with men or, or other key populations is critical so that they are able to uh, mobilize the community and lead these community-led responses. Um, it's a lot of it is about advocacy with service providers, going to the, the, the heads of, of the police, of health agencies, and advocating for the human rights of, of people, really. To, if, if police are involved in uh, coercion or extortion or even violence against sex workers, these are human rights and it's also legal rights that they should not be subjected to this. So it, it's really about advocating for a system-wide change in, in attitude of service providers. It, it's a lot of sensitization is needed to, to change these attitudes, but very difficult. Yeah, I, I think that there's, there's sort of the police sensitization, some of the sort of direct things that we can do around sensitizing police around um, some of these issues. Um, they're certainly empowering sex workers themselves to understand their rights um, and be able to kind of uh, argue for, for their rights when, when things happen or be able to tap into a community like a violence response system or something. So having some of those services set up when things do happen. I think that, you know, criminalization is there and it's, you know, we're certainly advocate. I mean, it, it'll be there for some time. And so I think it should also not be a barrier for us to continue really working um, on the ground with key populations. We've been able to do a lot um, in terms of, from a programming perspective, even in some of these very hostile environments and restrictive environments. So just to say that um, it shouldn't stop us from making sure that people are getting the services they need. And you know, I think what's interesting is there are often things that actually contradict, so, like Tim was saying, the human rights of these key populations clearly are, are gonna be <laughs> juxtaposed against these abuses, but also like, so again, in Kenya, just thinking about the constitution of Kenya guarantees a right to access of health services. And so the AIDS, the AIDS control unit in Kenya and the national bodies that deal with AIDS there in the health sector have been able to say, look, we know that it's illegal here to have a same-sex sexual relationship, but we're in line with the constitution. So they, I mean, government officials are able to work directly with MSM or with sex workers, and they've found these kind of workarounds. So it, it feels a lot about political will as opposed to actually getting, you know, getting something through, through a, a, a legislature. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Ed Scholl with Pathfinder in the E2A project. I'm just curious about um, the What's, what's new with um, funding and availability of PrEP for key populations, th either you know, through PEPFAR globally, and, and is there anything that Linkages is doing to, uh, to make PrEP uh, available to key populations? 
Sure. I mean, I think um, in terms of what Linkages is doing, we're doing a couple of things. One is um, we're developing sort of a prep uptake toolkit that um, governments and other stakeholders can use sort of at the country level to see if they're ready to implement prep in their setting. We're also in April actually holding a, a regional uh, prep kind of planning uh, for MSM in Africa. It'll be held in South Africa in April to really kind of get the ball rolling around prep in terms of, you know, what are the feasibilities of implementing? What, where does it look like we can get this going? Um, so really just starting that process and contributing to that. Hi, uh, my name is Jonathan and I also work on linkages as well. So with the last year's country operational planning process with PEPFAR, there was a huge move towards strategic data-driven decisions and that really manifested itself into geographic sort of prioritization. And the EPI for KPOPs doesn't exactly align with that super, super well. Like you have F female sex workers who are highly mobile. And then you also have things where PEPFAR is such a data-rich environment that you have things like human right indexes or gender analyses that are not as measurable as test and start. So especially when you consider the huge amounts of prevalence that uh, key populations have in regards to the HIV overall epidemic, what is the argument for making sure key population programming gets its due in future COP processes? Well, we, we're talking very much about location and population specific responses. So I think it's, the data are often not there for key populations, but um, as was mentioned by Meg about the mapping of the local populations is critical to getting the size estimation of local populations and really homing in where we can be most effective. What are the populations most impacted and where are they uh, residing and working? This is really critical to get our mapping correct and, and use that for, for localizing our responses. You know, and I, I think one of the things that would be useful to do is to measure some of these other pieces around, like, violence, to have specific, you know, measure levels of violence, ability to get services after you have an experience of violence, because I do think that that's going to have a direct impact on people going to get HIV services. Like, I think Tim and, both, and Meg both said, if violence is your priority and not HIV, which makes complete sense, right, that there are probably opportunities as well where we can say offering services for violence may bring people in to, to pick up more HIV services. But I think having multiple ways that you're thinking about it and not just at that you know, number of tested and, and having that, that focus, but I think it's a really good, a good question. And, and also I know that um, you know, PEPFAR and PEPFAR 3.0 is, is very much focused on epidemic control. Um, and, you know, when you look at the epidemiology of HIV and you look at the epidemiology amongst key populations in particular, it's very clear, as Ambassador Burke said, that we cannot control this pandemic unless we address key populations. Robin has just reminded me of a, an example we're just starting to support in Zimbabwe, in Harare. It's a 24-hour clinic which addresses, uh, provides services for sexual and gender-based violence. And once people come in who've been subjected to violence and abuse, there's the opportunity then to provide them a whole range of other HIV and STI services and sexual and reproductive health services. So addressing violence is, in fact, a good entry point for getting greater uptake of, of services. And I, I mean, I really think like if you want to find those most at risk among those most at risk, <laughs> it's the individuals experiencing violence. Like a, 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 you know, a man who has sex with men, who's a lawyer, who's, uh, you know, partnered, who's who, like there's versus somebody who a man who has sex with men who's selling sex on the street and is homeless. Like those two people are completely different in terms of the risks that they have. So one of them is also much more likely to be experiencing violence. Not that both of them could not be right, but. I think if we think about violence as really an offering us a guide and a new entry point, that that's a really effective way to think about HIV programming and make sure that we're responding to human rights.
We have time for a few more questions, if anybody has. Okay, so we, we really appreciate everybody's time and the questions that you had, and, and we can hang out for a little bit afterward if you have specific questions for any of us. And again, we really would love for you to be following us um, on Twitter or liking us on Facebook to get a lot of our updates. The blog that we have really is an excellent opportunity to hear directly from key populations. We've had a lot of bloggers from the trans community, sex workers, MSM, who talk about the day-to-day -day experiences that they have. We've really reached out a lot, particularly in Africa, because that's been a, a location where people have had less access to sharing those stories. So if you're interested in, in hearing those stories firsthand in sharing resources through us, you know, we're always looking to be able to share others' resources to amplify those voices as well, then please do that. And uh, thank you for your time. <laughs>